Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listoolpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged.
So earlier this week, I was listening to Brian Reagan. He is a wonderful comedian, uh, one who is highly intelligent. And what I love most is he finds ways to be witty and highly funny without going into the, uh, the unclean or the, the dirty language or the jokes that are not appropriate. He's really good at keeping it family friendly while still focusing on things that are really quite humorous. And he was, he was focusing on himself. He was focusing on something about himself that he does not like at all, and that's his indecisive nature. He's one of those people that uh, focuses on so many different factors that he becomes indecisive, almost like analysis paralysis. And he was talking about how throughout his day, it keeps coming up over and over again. When he's driving, he's sitting there and he's like, oh, do I change the lane? No, no, I'm good. Do I change the lane? No, 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 I'm not gonna do it. Okay, I start to go, no, I'm not gonna go again. Do any of you have anyone in your life that that rings a bell or sounds similar to? Another thing he brought up was how he goes to restaurants all the time and he's looking at the menu and he said the larger the menu, the more torturous it is for him because he sits there over and over going, they all sound so good, I have no idea what I want. How many of you have ever had that experience before, whether as yourself or someone you know and they just cannot make up their mind? Well, one of the ways that it's really funny is he has this habit of changing his mind in the middle of his sentences. So he'll be talking to someone, he'll be interacting, and he will change what he wants to say. And he was talking with one of his friends the other day, and he said, well, then fine, you just, uh, you just take, take luck. And he was about to say, take care and good luck, and somehow formed and fused them together and said, take luck. And he's like, it sounded so awkward. It was horrible. I mean, I sounded like I was suddenly becoming Shakespearean. Take ye luck now and go. And he's like, it just was horrible. And the person randomly looked at him the whole time and said, take luck. Who's luck? What's luck? What are you talking about? And they were so confused. And he said he just, he just tried to do something good, but because he changed his mind in the middle of it, it made things worse and made things more confusing. But not all change is a bad thing, and not all change that we're trying to implement will lead to such confusion and such funny circumstances. Some change is good. In fact, I believe some change is truly for the better. And if we're not willing to change, we will never have the capacity to improve. And that's one of the things that I've really been focusing on recently. I've been reading a lot of leadership books and the majority of leadership books say, if what you're doing isn't good enough, you have to change what you're doing. You have to change your system, change your approach, change your, your focus. You have to change something in order for you to get better results, better improvement. 
And this is something that I think is vital and important. It's also a spiritual thing. Change for the better is a good thing, but it still requires change and something that is different. And many of us have an apprehension about different. We're going to be continuing our series today, looking back to move forward, our, our focus on the book of Acts. And we're going to be focusing today specifically on Peter and how God starts to change Peter's mind and his heart and starts to shape how he was doing ministry to be very different. And because of those changes, Peter's ministry is so much more effective and he ends up becoming one of the most incredible people for reaching the gospel to different places and going into the whole Gentile world and bringing the gospel. Without him doing this, we would have still had some form of barriers and walls and God would have had to look for other ways to get in. But because Peter was willing to change, God used him to do something wonderful. And so we're going to be looking at Acts 9 today, verses 32 to 43. And it starts off this way. Meanwhile, Peter traveled from place to place and he came down to visit the believers in a town called Lydda. There he met a man named Ananias who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, roll up your sleeping mat. And he was instantly healed. Then the whole population of Lydda and Sharon saw Ananias walking around and they turned to the Lord. There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which is Greek for Dorcas. She was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. About this time, she became ill and she died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in the upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby in Lydda, so they sent two men to beg him, please come here as soon as possible. So Peter returned with them, and as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The room was filled with windows, or oh, sorry, with widows, who were weeping and showing him the coats and the other cloaks that Dorcas had made for them. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and he prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Get up, Tabitha. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the other believers and he presented her to them alive. The news spread through the whole town and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. This is our passage for today. It's what we're going to be looking at. And I think it is a wonderful collection of verses that Luke has recorded. A narrative that shows a wonderful pattern developing. In order for us to figure out what God is meaning for us to draw from this passage, what we can learn from it today, I would just ask that you join me as we say a word of prayer and ask for his help. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you are gracious and you are kind. You are so good and you have given us incredible books like Luke and the recordings that he made so we can understand how to minister for you, how to be your people, what your heart is like and how we can replicate it, how we can be like you. Give us the ability now to understand your truth in this passage. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help, of, help us in this and that you would be able to bring us greater understanding of how we need to change and be made different. So we ask for your help in guiding us in that as well. We pray that this would go according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Now on to the fun part, and that is trying to understand this passage better and trying to figure out what it should mean for us today. Now, there are several different ways that we could read this passage, several ways that we can interpret it, and we could fixate on different aspects. But the part that I want to really draw your attention to is specifically how Paul was ministering, or how Paul, how Peter was ministering, how Peter was actually being used by God, being directed by God, and how this was showing a change in his normal behavior. And so that's what I wanted us to look at today, and we'll see exactly what that looks like by starting off at the very beginning. Now, Luke is focusing on Peter and how he is beginning this portion of his ministry, traveling from place to place. Now, we don't know exactly where this fits in the timeline. We don't know if this is Peter coming with John, 
on his way back down from Samaria. Because it does say that he is traveling down to Lydda. Now, that could be because geographically he was up in Samaria, still coming down. Or he could have actually made it back to Jerusalem to be there when Paul was presented to the apostles. And he could be leaving Jerusalem. That could be more of an altitude thing. He traveled down from the high point of Jerusalem down to Lydda, which was over by the coast. So it could be referring to that. We don't know exactly. But what we do know specifically is that Peter is starting to do traveling ministry. He's no longer stationed in Jerusalem and staying there. And part of that has been an ongoing start already of God changing his heart, taking him from the place where he was comfortable and he understood what was going on, out of that area to a whole new world. And so Peter is now traveling around from place to place, and he is being used by God in a wonderful and powerful way. Now, it starts off with Peter now coming to this place where he is, he is being used in a, a way that he's comfortable. He's going into a town, he's preaching the gospel, and he's doing miracles. That is stuff that Peter is very, very comfortable with. He did it with Jesus before. He did it after Jesus in Jerusalem. He even did it when he was up in Samaria. So this is kind of, again, him in his comfort zone of what he is able to do. Now, he starts off by identifying that Peter had been called to a place called Lydda. Lydda was a town that is filled up with an assortment of different people. It would have had traditionally Jews within it. It would have also had Samaritans within it. And it would have also had a large component of Gentiles in it. So this is where we're starting to see a little bit of a difference now into where Peter is going to minister. He's ministering in a place that is not quite Jewish in its customs and its belief, similar to Jerusalem. So this is where he is starting to come out of his comfort zone. And when he is ministering, he meets a man named Ananias. And Ananias has been paralyzed and unable to get out of his sleeping mat for eight years. This is Ananias' comfort zone. And what's interesting is Peter is so moved by the Holy Spirit and with compassion for this man that he goes up to Ananias and tells him, get up and roll up your sleeping mat, which is a very strong and very impossible commandment. You can't just walk up to a person who is completely lame and tell them, get up and walk. But because God is moving through Peter, and because God is the one who is motivating this, instantly, literally instantly, his legs are healed. And Ananias is able to stand up and get up. And he's able to bend over, roll up his sleeping mat, and he is able to walk around. He's able to obey the command that Peter gave him. His life has been completely changed and transformed. Now, this is a miracle. This is wonderful. But it's not something that's different. Peter has already done this before. We've already seen it happen. God's already been doing this. He's done it through Philip. He's done it through John. He's done it through Peter. He's done it through many of the followers of Jesus. So this is not something that's totally different. But this is different for Ananias. This is where we get to see some of that change coming out in his situation. Because listen to exactly what Peter tells him to do. Get up and roll up your sleeping mat. Get up, which is something that he can't do, and roll up your sleeping mat. Take away the place that has been your comfort zone. The place that has been your home for the last eight years. And why would you be rolling up your sleeping mat? Because no longer are you needing it. No longer are you needing to be a beggar who is on the street hoping for the mercy of other people. Now you have the capacity and the ability to fulfill your own destiny, to work in your own calling, and to be active in life. You can make your own living. You can have a job. You can be used by God. These things are now fully possible for you, but only if you get up off of your mat and roll it up so you no longer return to it. You no longer need that crutch. You no longer need that there for you. Now you need to get rid of that so you can start your new life. This requires great change for Ananias. It requires him to have to get up and transform himself completely, push away from his old life and move on to bigger things, newer things. And Ananias does exactly as he's commanded. And God 
honors it, and he is able to be healed completely, and he is able to step out a changed man. And he is so active in his new life that all of the people in Lydda and the surrounding area of Sharon, where Sharon was like the, the large region around them, all of the people in those areas heard about his healing. They heard what he had done, they saw him, and they recognized that a miracle had taken place. And they began to believe. So that in itself is a wonderful testament of change. But not on the part of Peter yet. This is on Ananias. And this is Peter again still operating this comfort zone. While Peter is there, two disciples come up to him. Two disciples that he may have known or may not have known. They are not named by Luke. But two disciples who are believers in Jesus come up to him and they say, Peter, we need your help right away. We need you to come to Joppa. Because in Joppa, there is a lady named Tabitha who fell ill and she passed away and died. And we need you to be there because we believe God is working through you. Miracles are coming and you can do the impossible. Tabitha is a wonderful woman. She is incredible. She is loving and kind. She cares for the widows and the orphans. And she has, been, she has been sick and she finally died. And she is leaving us too soon. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to draw your attention to here. The first thing is that Peter immediately drops what he is doing in Lydda, just completely drops it and goes with these other people to a place where We don't know if he's ever been before to meet a woman that he clearly has never met before because they are introducing him. They are explaining who she is and they're not saying your friend Tabitha. They're saying Tabitha, a kind woman who's been sick and just died. They're giving him the whole backstory. So we're asking you to leave what you're doing, what you are called into by God, to leave it all behind to come to an unknown place right away to help a stranger. Now we don't know exactly if... if, if Tabitha was as a widow or not, but we knew, we knew she cared for widows and she hung around a lot of people who were widows, but we don't know if she was a widow or not. But we do know that Peter immediately chooses to do that. He leaves everything behind to follow these people and go to Joppa. Another thing I want to bring up is the fact that Tabitha is being described as a wonderful, generous, compassionate, kind woman. And yet she is still dying and being taken away from this earth in what feels like to all of these people that know her too soon, way too early. And I think this is something that we need to identify and we need to talk about because there are people in this world who are wonderful, incredible, kind people that feel like they are taken away too quickly. They make the world a better place when they are here. Why does God take them away? Why does God choose to bring them away? And why doesn't God take away some of the the people that would make our world a better place if they were no longer here? These are very valid questions. And they are very difficult questions. And ones that we are not given an answer to. The Bible doesn't actually tell us why God takes some people when he does and why he doesn't. It just tells us that he has a perfect plan. And he has a plan that's bigger than what we know. So even when we don't understand what's happening, this is where we as believers are required to have faith. To trust in something that we don't understand and we can't yet see to believe that God is true to his promise. And if God is fully good, he is only going to do what is good and what is right even when it doesn't make sense to us. That's where we need to have faith. Just just on Tuesday of this week, one of the people that I really looked up to passed away and was taken away too soon. For those who don't know, Lori Gibbons was the superintendent for our district. He was also an incredible leader, a pastor to pastors. He took time to know people and invest in their lives and care about them. He did everything in his power to make you feel like you were were worthwhile and worth his time, even though his time was very valuable. And he constantly made time for people. He was taken in what feels like too soon. But I'm choosing to have faith that God's plan is still active and he is still good, even when I don't understand it, even when I don't know why he did this. We learn 
in the book of Ecclesiastes that God brings good things and bad things on the world. Good people get bad things happening. Bad people get good things happening to them. But in all of it, it is still the fact that God is sovereign and he is still active and his plan is still working. So we choose to believe that. But these disciples chose to have faith in a greater capacity, not just to believe that God's plan was still active and going. They chose to believe that God could still heal Tabitha, even though she was dead. God could still bring her back from the dead and resurrect her. If he had done it for Jesus, if he had done it for people back in the Old Testament, if Jesus was able to do it to to people, why couldn't Peter do it? It's the same Holy Spirit working through him. So they came and they begged him. They literally, it says, they begged him to come. And Peter drops everything. He chooses to go to care for a stranger, to leave his ministry, to go to a totally different place. And while he is there, he enters into the building and is taken up to the room where she is being prepared for burial. She has simply been washed right now. She hasn't been anointed. Nothing else has been done to her at this moment. And Peter sees all of these other people who are weeping and crying. And the widows are explaining all of what Tabitha had done. She has made cloaks and clothes for us. She has been gracious and kind. She continues to love and care and provide for us. And Peter's response to that is, you need to leave the room. I need my space. I need my alone time with her. You need to get out right now. And he proceeds to come with faith, not brokenness, not sorrow, not being consumed in the hurt and the pain. He comes with faith and kneels down and prays. Now, we don't know what he prayed. We don't have a formula of what he he prayed, where I sometimes I wish we did. I wish we knew exactly what Peter had said. All we know is that after he was done praying, he sits down beside her, looks at her and says, get up, Tabitha. The exact same words he just gave to Ananias before, get up. One was lame. This is now someone who was dead. And he's literally saying to her, get up, Tabitha. Instantly, her eyes open. She sees Peter and she sits up. Now, we don't know if she recognizes or knows about Peter, makes a connection. We have no idea. All we know is that she was once dead and now she is brought back to life. Her eyes open, she sits up, and then Peter does something that's also very different. He takes his hand and holds it out to her and proceeds to take her hand so she can get up out of the bed. Now, for us, that sounds like he's being very kind and considerate. That's chivalry. That's good manners. Way to go, Peter. But what we don't understand is to a Jewish person, that would be considered horrible to do because you are now touching something that was once dead and unclean. That means you are now unclean. She has not yet been brought to a temple. She has not yet been cleansed. She has not yet been proven by a priest and declared clean again. None of that has happened, yet Peter is already reaching out and touching her. That is not considered a good thing for a Jewish person to do. That is outside of the Torah law, and that would be considered to be a sin. You are now unclean as well. But instead of Peter having any type of ceremony for cleansing after that for the two of them, he proceeds to take her and call everyone back into the room and then stand and present her now alive to all of the people that were mourning before. And there is great celebration. There is awe, shock, incredible rejoicing, and people turn to God. All of the people in Joppa that didn't already know suddenly see something that happened because they realized that Tabitha had died. That news would have gone out. And this woman who was kind and clearly highly influential in her neighborhood had been dead. And now she is alive again and literally talking and visiting with people and continuing her ministry. And this brought great glory to God. And many people turned and decided to follow him and gave their hearts and their lives to God. And that was, again, God taking Peter out of his comfort zone to do something different. To not go where he was going, but to have other people direct his ministry. To touch someone who was previously dead and unclean. And then Peter does the most revolutionary thing at the very end of this. I know, it sounds incredible. How can Peter do anything more incredible and wonderful than raising someone back from the dead with Jesus' power? How is this even possible? 
But Peter does something that we normally skip over that to a Jew would be considered incredible and ridiculous and very, very, I would say, surprising. He then proceeds to stay in Joppa for a long time, not just a short time, a long time to continue his ministry there, to continue to disciple these new converts and help them know what the gospel means and who Jesus is. And as he's doing this ministry, he proceeds to stay in the house of Simon the Tanner. Now, the part that jumps out for us is the fact that Peter decides to stay longer. He totally is derailed in his ministry, but decides to keep doing it because God's brought him there. He throws his agenda and his calendar out the window. That makes sense to us. But the part that the Jews will fixate on and the people who understand Old Testament law, they would look at it and say, okay, hold on a second. Peter is staying in the house of a tanner, a man who constantly handles dead animals. This is a person who would be deemed as unclean, socially ostracized. He would have to go through heavy, heavy ritualistic cleansing all the time to be made right again. And Peter is staying not just around him, but with him for a long time. For a Jew to stay in that house, out of all the places in Joppa he could have stayed, to stay in the house of a tanner is ridiculous. This is God changing his heart, how he thought, how he processed, in order to open up his eyes to understand who God was calling him to, who the gospel was intended to, who God was calling him to love and accept just as they were, not because they had gone through all of the rituals and the process to be made pure and right and good enough to warrant the gospel message. God was sending Peter And he was slowly starting to break down these barriers that he had in order to eventually lead Peter to the Gentiles. And this is where we are going to be going. But it's a process of God changing Peter for the good. Changing him for good. Peter was never going to go back to being the same. And this is where we get to recognize how God does something revolutionary and does it through Peter. And then this in turn influences the rest of the church and influences the rest of the apostles and the disciples and the followers of Jesus. And it changes the entire trajectory and the entire movement of God's gospel message. No longer is it confined to a small nation of Israel, But now it's going all over the world. And not just to all the Jews that have been displaced, but to all people. Because God changed Peter. He changed his heart. He changed his ministry. He changed everything about how he thought. And he changed how he used Peter for his gospel work. He changed Peter for the better. But Peter had to be willing to change. If he hadn't, What would the New Testament look like? How would we read it differently? Who would God have had to reach out to and call up? And how much of a challenge would it have been? Because there would have been different sects within this brand new community of believers. There would have been the disciples who were stuck to the old ways and people who were bringing in new ways of doing things. And it would have led to more and more conflict, not unity and harmony and God blessing it for great work. This is where we need to recognize the power of change. And how once we are transformed, God can use us for greater things. I truly believe that and I hope that you are able to recognize the truth in that too. And it becomes a reality in your life. Let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you are gracious. You are generous and you are good to us. But you are also very patient and walk alongside of us as we are being changed and transformed. We pray that we'd recognize what you're calling us to now and how we can obey, how we can follow you and always be willing, God, to be more like you. We pray, God, that we would be open to your change and transformation. We'd be willing to be made into a new creation and full of your great love so that we can be impacting and used wherever you want us to whoever you're calling us to make an impact for you and your kingdom. We ask and we pray for this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we uh, bring this to a close, I want to pray a benediction over you. For those who are watching and those who have heard this message, 
I pray that God would work on your heart first. And that heart would be something that is transformational. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 to 13, Paul says this. May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow. May he make your heart strong and blameless and holy because of that love so you can stand before the God our Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again as his holy people. Amen? Amen. May God fill you up with his love and may it overflow and impact so many people today and for the rest of this week and in the future. Thank you so much for joining us. I pray you have a blessed week and an incredible rest of your day. Take care.